graciously allowed us to, to mold their hands and be participants as we've grown and is growing. The objects, the collection is now over 31 bronzes. And then the idea has also grown throughout the process. The artists have come from folks that we have worked with throughout our careers, uh, some that we came to know by way of work, all of them we greatly admire. But we feel as though the participants, we acknowledge the contributions that they've made to, to contemporary culture. Um, and when we go out there, you'll, you'll notice that we've arranged the exhibition today, not with a lot of biography background with each piece, but with a simple quote that is associated with each artist's interview. And we thought that it was kind of an intimate way of introducing how they feel about their process. With regards to the objects themselves, these are light castings. They're cast in bronze. They're done through the lost scraps process. There's one piece of Vanessa going into more detail on where we actually were able to use uh, scanning technologies, uh, which is an exciting story as well. But the idea behind the archive, I think, is what kind of excites us the most. It's the notion that artists throughout their careers, through their chosen material, are constantly affecting material. They're making things. It's the maker and the medium. But there's this other relationship between the medium and the maker, how the artist's material actually affects the artist. The hands of somebody who's been creating for decades shows process. They become more than just the means, the tool to create the importance of the artist themselves. And that's what I find particularly exciting. I think of the pieces almost as portraiture. Later on, when you get an opportunity to go up there and hold the pieces, you see the scars, the nicks, the dings, the strength, the muscularity, uh, in some cases, the fragility or the delicacy. You start to appreciate that the archive is more about not necessary celebrity or career length or importance. It certainly is that, but it's about the notion that humans need to create. We talk through our hands. This is the first time that we've shown the pieces since the pandemic, you know? And <clears throat> the pandemic for me, one of the strongest images was when a grandparent would put their hand up against a pane of glass and a grandchild would mirror it on the other side. Through disease, through isolation, through everything, we need to create, we need to touch and the hand is a vehicle that we're celebrating today. So that kind of gives us a little bit of an overview. I'm gonna turn it over to Vanessa and she's gonna take us through the story of some of the pieces. Thank you very much. Let's see. So my task here is to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> we shall see. I, I just need to thank Eric Fischel and April Gornick for their vision in creating this incredible space and in surrounding themselves with the talented team that has made the church what it is. I've seen, I, when they were first starting um, and I saw images of it, I saw a few videos, I wasn't prepared for how grand and special it is when I walked in, even the smell. Everything is done with love and care. And um, your vision, which has made this place possible, to have the American Artist Hands Archive here feels so fitting, so right. So thank you. So I have been surrounded by artists and makers and craftspeople all of my life. I grew up in my father's New York City sculpture studio. I began my apprenticeship when I was 17 years old. And I was immersed in the world of process and materials and the making of things and the chaos, and I loved it, and I still do. My father was a sculptor and chose as his medium possibly the slowest way to express oneself, which is in carving stone. Uh, his pre preferred stone was marble. And he was pretty good. 
He earned his living, he made his living by working as a sculpture technician for other artists. In the New York City studio, he did enlarging and mold making, casting and restoration for other artists. He was incredibly skilled. He was a terrific draftsman. He was a solid engineer and a good mechanic. But I think the overriding umbrella for his ability to be so successful was that he had the discipline of ego that enabled him to work for other artists and still find time in stolen moments to do his own work. When my father died, I went to his studio. Ah, his hands. His hands were incredibly powerful, yet capable of modeling a butterfly's wing. And when my father died, I went to his studio to tidy up and clean up, as you do, and I came upon a bronze casting of his hand. And I knew immediately how this thing came to be. I knew that he had plunged his hand into a bucket of rubber, pulled his hand out, poured a wax in, sent it to a local foundry, and had it cast in bronze. And there it, there it was, underneath a bench, in a bucket, of course. And when I came upon it, I took it out, I cleaned it up, and I had it on my workbenches all these years. And having this physical record in bronze of this hand that I knew so well enabled me to think of, it represented to me all the lessons I'd learned of process, of material, of patience, of strength, tenacity, lessons learned, the passing on of knowledge. But having, the, having this physical bronze of this hand that I knew so well in life also enabled me to look at it in a different way. And what happened for me was it brought out on what was in my subconscious was something that I always knew was how our hands, which were messing with materials for so many years were impacted by the materials. Because I would look at this arthritic stone carver's paw, and that's what the stone carvers look like. All of the clay people had cracked, dried thumbs, and the woodworkers all had missing bits. And I started to think of the incredible artists that we had worked for over so many years and I, and I also knew that the, the subject of the life of our hands was always at the forefront in the studio. We're always talking about what Band-Aid, what brace, what, who was being slowed down, who had to get surgery, who couldn't do what. It was always there. But it was never in the forefront of my consciousness until I had the opportunity to reflect on this life casting. And this is how the American Artist Hand Archive was born, because I thought if I cherished it so much, and it was fascinating to me so much, that certainly other people would feel this way too. And I thought it was an important thing to do, to record the hands of these great makers of our time. So over many years, I'd done a lot of work with Jasper Johns. And more often than not, our work days would end with a cup of tea complaining to each other about our arthritis, because that's what we talk about, right? And I called Jasper, and I told him of the idea of making this archive, this collection, and he simply said, good idea, come on over. And while we were working, while I was molding his hand, I was lamenting the fact that I had the privilege and the honor of working with so many great artists of our day, Albert Wien and Frederick Hart, Louise Nevelson. Thomas and I worked with William de Kooning. Look at us, we're such babies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but during those years, I didn't have the idea to record their hands. It was just the work. It was always the work. 
and then they died and the opportunity to record their hands was gone. And Jasper looked at his hand dripping in purple rubber and he said, and that process will continue. By the way, that lends your project a sense of urgency, doesn't it? Have you called Bob Indiana? He's getting up there in years. He's quite eccentric though, you know. Thomas and I had done a series of castings for Robert Indiana in the 80s, and when I called Bob Indiana, he remembered me right away, and he said, I'd be delighted in terms of participating in the archive, but do you know where I live? Well, yeah, I know where he lives. He lives 15 miles off the coast of Maine on an island. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you get the New York Times and milk delivered? And he said, well, of course. And I said, well, then don't worry. I'll get to you. That's my problem. So my husband and I drove 12 hours up the coast of Maine and David deposited me at the ferry and off I went. My cell phone immediately died and Bob had not told me a street address. He just said, I live next door to the post office. I said, okay. So we set a date and off I went and I was wheeling my little suitcase on wheels all the way up this hill and when I got to the top of the hill, his house was really easy to spot. <laughs> I knew I was in the right place. He ushered me in and he insisted that I sign the guest book. And um, then he insisted to show me every single room of his house. And it was um, a surreal, magical, special moment. He showed me every treasure. I asked, of course, if I could take photos. And he said, I insist. And then he said, and that rug that you're standing on was given to me by Louise Nevelson, and I, I wanted to go like this. But we went through each room, and each room was decorated in the most theatrical way. <laughs> and there were stuffed animals everywhere, and every animal had a name. And they were very important to him. And it's, it's wonderful and funny, but they were, they were there, and they were everywhere. It was a privilege to look over his shoulder when he was showing me the books. He's, he was getting ready to do a, um, a book on his work. And it was a delight for him to show me the pictures that he had made when he was a child. When we finally got to the molding, he asked his assistant to take a photograph, which helps me enormously, but he also insisted that his favorite stuffed animal be in the frame of that picture. <laughs> it was a, a remarkable day that I'll never forget. And he was very pleased with the casting, which you'll see upstairs. My dear friend, Kenneth Snelson, who's no longer with us. This is an image of him working on one of his complex fabricated sculptures up at Talix Foundry. Thomas, um, sorry, Kenneth was very excited about participating in the archive and we spent a wonderful day rummaging around in his Santa's workshop. Um, Kenneth chose to hold an aluminum tube that he had calibrated that enabled him to scale up his models to heroic size. And while I was molding his hand, we talked about the life of his hand, of course, as we always do. And he said, don't you manicure that thumb. I worked very hard for that thumb. I promised him I wouldn't, which I, I mean, that was the whole point, right? When I called Beverly Pepper, I barely got my elevator pitch out, and she said, I do everything with my hands. I cook, I weld, I sew, I weld, I cook. Did I tell you I weld? How can I help you? <laughs> and I said, Beverly, I, I just need you to think of a gesture that's interesting to you and sit still for a few minutes. And she said, this is my default position when I'm thinking. While I was molding her hands, and we talked about a lot of things, I, I asked her if 
there was a single trait that she might share with me that an artist could use, would need to survive, maybe thrive. And I thought for sure she was going to say tenacity. And she said courage. And then those words are with me to this day. Judy Pfaff. Judy Pfaff was not particularly interested in a gesture per se, but it, she was completely, uh, completely smitten with the mold rubber, and it was all I could do to have her sit, keep her hands still for just that moment. Um, when I brought the bronze back to her studio to get her input on the patina, she pointed to her shoe and said, can you do that? And my friend, the, Ro the patentist Rosemary Rednauer, just nailed it. And when my son Dana saw these, the, the object in the picture, he said, Mom, this looks like something you'd see in the Hubble Space Telescope. And I said, that's Judy. And everyone that sees the sculpture and these images says, that's Judy. You know this guy. Eric Fischel didn't seem to be so interested in a particular gesture. Eric was more interested in the form, the finished form that his hands would take. And it seemed very fitting that the patina that I would do would be similar to the patinas that he had guided me through on many of his life-size pieces. When I texted Eric, an image of the patina in process, he just said, cool, more drippy. <laughs> Martin Purrier, ever thoughtful, was very interested to be part of the archive, and he took about four months to decide on his gesture his pose, and I'm convinced to this day that when I showed up at his place to record his hand, he did something at the moment very impromptu. He just stretched his hand back as far as he could, and he said, this is how I measure. Martin chose to have his hand cast in white bronze, manganese bronze, just simply for the aesthetic, and you'll see it upstairs. It was very successful, massive hands. Huma Baba is a fearless maker. Huma uses every conceivable material. Huma Baba. Um, she, is, she works in cork and wood and leather and taxidermy materials and burlap and stone and foam and <laughs> cardboard. And she just says, I like texture. I like materials and I like to feel it. Titus Kafar is an, is an exceptionally gifted painter. And when I was molding his hand, he was contemplating his hand and he told me that his, some of his friends teased him about the rather unorthodox way he held his pencil. This was the pose he chose, saying simply, this is my primary tool. Thomas and I had the great fun of molding William Crozier's hands in the city in Thomas's offices at the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. And while I was, while I was busy setting up my mold supply, Thomas laid a lump of clay down on the table, and when I turned around, there was Bill doing what Bill does, which is the pushing and the pulling of clay. And it was so Bill. It was this moment that was so perfect. We didn't talk a lot. He just took to the clay and did his thing, did what Bill does. I 
I'd met Chuck Close at the, Willi at the de Kooning retrospective in the city, and we spent the evening talking about process. He was very interested in our work on the de Kooning enlargements, and he invited me to his studio the next day to continue the conversation. So while we were there, of course, I invited him to participate in the archive. And he was intrigued, but a little bit, not skeptical, but just a little reserved. And he said, let me ask you a question. Do you have other significant artists on your list? And I was taken aback by that. And I said, well, um, I have Ursula von Riddingsvard and, and Maya Lin and Judy Pfaff and Mary Frank and um, Jasper Johns and Eric Fischel. And he said, I'm in. So he was very generous with his time and very supportive of the project. I was really anxious about molding his hands because as a paraplegic, I had no sense of his strength. I asked my subjects to wiggle out of the mold. It's pretty physical, and I had no sense of his ability to do that. And he was a champ. He said, I, I may have some restrictions, but I get by. But he also took the time to show me the work that was in progress, and that was a real privilege. He showed me these images of his hands that were taken years before, and we talked about the progression of his hands from that period to the current day and the change, the physical changes he had gone through. April Gornick chose a pose, and you can chime in at any point, because my interpretation was that, um, because it, it takes a long time, it takes like an hour, an hour and a half, it's tiring. And April chose this pose of holding her hands together that was interesting to her, but she, she held her hands away from her body and down. It seemed comfortable. It seemed like a comfortable pose, and it was an interesting pose, but it was more about comfort. But I love this photograph. I'm sorry I cut the top of your head off, but the joy in her face of coming out of the sarcophagus of the mold, that <laughs> moment is just like, ah, you know, it's this moment. But while this amazing thing happened that didn't happen on any of the other bronzes in that when I was working on the wax and then working on the metal and moving it in every conceivable configuration, up, down, upside down, it, it landed in this place that was so perfect. And it said, this is how I need to live. And to me, it's just so, it's so beautiful and so lyrical and so elegant and so April. Mm -hmm. James Hart is a wood carver of totems. He hails from the Pacific Northwest. He is a chief of the Haida Nation, and he chose this to hold a, a, bl a favorite blade. When I asked him about the patina for his composition, he said that this sculpture, which was his very first bronze, his very first 20-foot bronze, had a lot of meaning to him, and could we do that patina? And the wonderful patinist Andrew Farmer just nailed it. Tosho Odate is 93 years old. He's an active, very busy sculptor living in Connecticut. Toshio was about 91 when he agreed to participate in the archive. To call Toshio a, a, a woodworker is not okay. He's a sculptor and a, a master of his craft. When Toshio decided to hold a steel blade, his steel sharpening blade against the polishing stone. This blade was given to him by a blacksmith when he was 15 years old. He's 91. And when he put that blade in his hand and his hands locked around that piece of steel, I was struck by, all I could see was muscle memory. 
I mean, he would do that in his sleep. He's been doing that since he was 15. There was no discussion about that position. And I said as much. And he looked up at us and he said, this is my biography. This is my identity. Ugh. So this was the pose. Oops. Molding Toshio's hands and the blade on the stone, the whole composition was not a big, it is a big deal, everything's a big deal, but it wasn't a technical problem except for the fact that this particular sharpening stone, which is essentially priceless, which comes from a, the bottom of a lake in Kyoto, which has a, a surface like the finest talc. Steve, you'll appreciate this. It's got a surface of perhaps a 10,000 grit sandpaper. It's crazy fine. And Toshio sharpens his stone 10 or 20 times a day. He sharpens his blade on this. So when we realized that the stone was porous, the idea of even going near it with our mold compound, although it's safe for skin, the idea of possibly mar damaging or ruining the stone in any way and rendering this tool useless was just a, a, a non-starter. And Thomas said, why don't we scan the stone? And that was a game changer. That was the first time that we had gone from pure old school process into using the digital technologies in making one of our sculptures for the archive. So we covered the stone with tin foil to protect it. It looks like a baked potato. And when we had Toshio put his hand in the position, and then we were able to successfully mold him, his hand in position. And then we took the stone to a digital place where they scanned it without touching it, without marring it. And I brought the stone back to Toshio and I was so happy to say, here you go. <laughs> and from the scan data, we made a 3D print in resin, a plastic print that was identical in size and shape. It was really quite flawless, except for the fact that anything printed has fine process marks from the, from the printing process. So I had the happy task of erasing those marks by hand. So we went from digital back to hand work. So we had a perfect reproduction of the stone. Then we were able to take the printed stone, make a mold over that, and have both components, the hand and the stone, in wax to go through the traditional lost wax process. You with me? You will be quizzed. Okay. okay. So this is at the foundry, and we wanted to make sure that the wax casting fit the stone, the printed stone first. We got everything right. Then we made a mold over the print, and then we went on to cast the bronze. Now this is very cool because on the underside of Toshio's steel blade, the blacksmith that made this for him forged his name and the date and the type of steel of this particular blade. And when Toshio holds this blade, this is facing down. So no one ever sees that, and no one will ever see that in the bronze composition that's upstairs, because it's on the underside. But you can. You will. So when we had both components cast in bronze, then the tricky part came in marrying the two together. And when you see the bronze upstairs, you'll realize that the only point of attachment from one, the hands to the stone, is about a quarter of an inch wide edge of this very thin blade. So we had to weld that and had to be welded from underneath. Otherwise, you, you ruin the. So we got everything set up. And my dear friends at workshop up in Kingston crawled under the table, and at just the right moment, Vinny hit the, the welder button, and boom, we had it right. Cool, huh? Yeah. Vanessa? I just, uh, there's something interesting about Tosha's hands. Uh, Tosha taught at Pratt, uh, where Vanessa taught, where Vanessa and I actually met, 
uh, I studied there, and Tosha taught a class in woodworking. And the first thing that you did was you made a dovetail box, and it was the simplest thing. It was four pieces of wood, and you cut dovetails, and you put it together, but you learned how to sharpen a chisel. I was 17 at that time. That was the beginning of my career in all of this. But Tosho talks about the essence of sharpening a tool is to getting the blade to where it is nothing. You, you take the blade down to the point where it's nothing so that you can make something. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that's one of the most poetic statements you can possibly imagine about an artist. To, to boiling something down to its very, very essence to the point of nothing so that you can make something. So this piece, I think, for both of us, holds a particular spot for us. Excuse me for interrupting. Not at all, no, it's wonderful. So once we had the bronze, once we had the bronze to where we wanted it, then we went into the patina, and that you'll see upstairs as well. Oops, chalk walking and chewing gum. It's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. Some people feel very strongly about that. Um, others, I do my thing. I do something that's instinctive. To, it's a really, every, the 31 upstairs, um, it's a total mixed bag. So I'm going to just wrap this part up, and then we have a, some things to show you. But I just. Um, Working in sculpture all of my life has been a totally collaborative process. Working for other artists to help them realize their vision, getting stuff up into space, is a collaboration. The American Artist Hands Archive is a collaboration between the artists who wanted to participate, who are participating, and also of all of the craftspeople that have helped me along the way, the foundry people, the wax makers, the patentists. So it feels like I've come full circle in this expression to acknowledge these great makers, to work with Thomas since we were pups, going through these studios, to have Thomas part of this, the fiber of this project. It all feels so right, and I'm just so grateful and thrilled to be here and share this with you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is, this is the, uh, the warm mic now. You go, go get a drink of water. <laughs> Uh, that was incredible, right? I mean, what an amazing, you know, uh, one of the, the joys about working with Vanessa on this project is that uh, Vanessa has established these relationships with so many artists and understands the process uh, from being a young woman working with her dad up until, you know, today. She understands process. She understands uh, the joys, the pains, the trials, the tribulations of making art, you know? And to be able to create the archive with Vanessa is a piece of sculpture in and of itself. You know, there, there's something here that's bigger than just hands. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, a lot of the photographs, the, the close-up photographs of shots are done by Mark Lacko, who's a, a mutual friend of Vanessa and ours. Uh, Mark's a Pratt guy as well, an industrial designer, incredible photographer. Uh, there's nothing that we do in the archive that isn't documented in several ways, either in recording, in photographs, in writing. Each stages of the bronze are recorded in photographs, so there's a process, there's a history to it. Not just uh, to chronicle it, but also to create this archive. It's not simply the bronzes themselves, it's, it's a whole body of information that I think is important to have. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things here on the table. Maybe we'll drag the table towards us. I'm going to turn this off for a second while I drag the table over.
I'll try to, I'll try to do this uh, one-handed. Uh, a lot of people ask, you know, how, how do we make these molds? You know, how do you get this incredible accuracy? And we get it through modern technologies that have continually improving. Uh, we were talking of that. We use a surgical grade silicone rubber. But I wanted to start off with, this is a, a 19th century plaster cast. Oh, thank you. It's a 19th century plaster cast. Uh, which has evidence of the amount of piece molds that it would take to actually make that with a rigid material prior to having flexible rubber. To cast this hand, there would be 16 separate little pieces of puzzle work that would have to interlock to create the cavity into which the plaster was poured. So every one of those little pencil lines is taken so that it can pull out from a lock or from a curve where it would normally, if the plaster were to go around it as a rigid material, it would be encased. So, luckily, flexible rubbers allow us to get around that completely. So we have the ability to mold something, but we can do it with a minimum of seams, of parting lines. If anybody's gone to the Rodin Museum or seen a Rodin, Rodin absolutely loved the craftsmanship of the piece molds. Uh, so often he would say, do not chase those away. For his work, that's incredibly beautiful. For our work, we try to eliminate that as much as possible. Uh, this silicone mold here, we're basically making a rubber glove over somebody's hand. So the, the rubber is painted like you saw in, in the, the photographs here. And when you take a rubber glove off, there's no structure to it. You know, so it sort of flops around. All of a sudden, you have no integrity to the form. So before the rubber comes off the hand, a plaster shell is put over the rubber. So that gives us a rigid shell into which the rubber registers. So the shell comes off the hands, the rubber is peeled away, the rubber goes back into the shell, and now we have a perfectly registered impression of the hand. Fast and dirty. Uh, fast and dirty. Mom, whose hand is this, by the way? This is actually my cousin Victor's. This is cousin Victor's hand. <laughs> Thank you, cousin Victor. Um, we have a Tosho's hands, you know, the one that Vanessa was talking about, the gentleman who's sharpening his blade. The, we, we need to make, since you don't want somebody's hands to be encased forever and ever and ever, if there's an hour's worth of molding going on, you want to get that mold off as soon as possible. You make a casting into it. If there's any shifting or corrections that are made, it's done at that point. And then a mold can be made over that piece into which wax will be cast. Now, we brought a little sample of the mold making rubber here, uh, the Judy Faf special color. This is a, a two-part, uh, there's the blue and the catalyst, and then the little bottle that Vanessa has. I, do you want me to mix, or do you want? This is my life. You, you, want, you want gloves? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a two-part, it's a one-to-one. -one. It gets mixed together. You want to make sure that it's completely mixed so you don't have any uncatalyzed spots. She has a little squeeze bottle here. That's a, a thixotropic, which allows the, the, the material to have it's like frosting. You're, you're giving it body so that it can be spatulated onto a surface. I'll tell you what, my bread, my rubber always sets, but my bread don't always last. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest fear in the world is to have rubber on somebody and say, oh, sorry. So that this, we have a, a sample hand here at which we are going to. Uh, this, this actually is uh, from a very, very well known artist named Thomas Donahue. Uh, <laughs> When we were in Amsterdam, two weeks before we did the same exhibition in Amsterdam, uh, I had the good fortune of falling off a concrete wall and busting both bones in my arm. So I went to Amsterdam to do a hands lecture with a broken arm and a huge cast, but my right hand was available, so I became the, the model uh, for that lecture. So this, this is actually my hand. We're going to pour some of the rubber directly over it so that you can get a sense as to how good the impression can be made and how quickly it can be gotten. So you can see why Judy Faf went so crazy, right? And you can see, and it's just, um, it's kind of a sensual fun. It, Robert Indiana said, it's so icky, I'm surprised it doesn't hurt. We and consider it like an industrial manicure, yeah, you know? Right, right. It's so, um, so you, you build up a layer and, 
about 15 minutes or so. Um, we have little latitude. We can make it set faster or slower depending upon the complexity of the composition. I, I'm sort of doing a, what I call a nuclear set today because I want this to set and then perhaps we'll just leave it here. We'll go upstairs and play around and then peel it off. I'll bring it up later, later and we'll peel it off and you get the idea. The wonderful thing about this silicone is that it literally picks up a fingerprint off of a piece of glass. It was designed for prosthetic work. It was designed, we're starting to set up all of I make a mean cheesecake, by the way. <laughs> this is it. This is so. um, it really is remarkable. I had the strangest encounter one day. I had a series of the bronzes in my home before we happily ran out of room. And a woman came by and was looking at them and she turned to me and she said, you know, I'm a palm reader. And I can talk to these hands via what I'm seeing in the, thing, the, the fingerprint. We didn't go too far down that path. <laughs> just, please don't let her read my hand. Yes, right, that's how accurate this material is. And the other part that's very important to the archive is unlike the other molding compounds that are often used in schools, alginates and things, this has a pretty much an unlimited shelf life when it's cared for properly. So the molds from the, origi the original primary mold are kept in very careful conditions for posterity. Older molding rubbers uh, like latex uh, is moisture sensitive, so it can actually deform after alginates are very moisture sensitive. Uh, the things that you take your dental implants with, they're only good for a very specific period of time. Polysulfide rubber is something that we used years and years ago where lead, ba lead catalyzed and petroleum based and nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, I'm very grateful that this material is now available. We, uh, why don't we open up uh, Tosho's? This, yeah, okay. this is actually the wax production mold for Tosho's piece, uh, the gentleman who's sharpening the blade. And this shows the outer shell, the plaster shell. And then this is actually a three-piece shell that supports it. And then this is a, this is our, the... This is the mold that we actually made over Toshio while he was holding the blade against the stone. And it was pretty elaborate. There was a lot of bottom layers going on with the lead. And it was um, pretty intense. But we always try to make sure that our subjects are comfortable. Yep. Everything's been taken care of before we start, and are you okay? And people have different reactions. Um, people have very different reactions. Most of the, I find the older older people are extremely calm and relaxed, and the younger subjects tend to be a little more impatient. Um, the beginning needs to have their hair all slightly adjusted, and they needs to have their eyeglasses. It's just really, it's very intense. It's very intense for me. It's a very intimate process. I mean, you, 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 these, are, <laughs> these are folks that their, their whole being is about moving their hands, about creating, and all of a sudden you're asking them, hold still. You know, let me capture that moment. You're freeze framing a moment that doesn't exist for most people who are makers. You know, they're either thinking, working, doing something. And once we have this cavity uh, that we can now pour wax into at the beginning of the, the lost wax process, if you think about a chocolate Easter bunny, you know those, those Easter bunnies, you bite the, the ears off and it's hollow inside? Wax casting is somewhat similar to that. On some castings, because the, the void is small enough that they ultimately become solid, but for the most part, bronze castings are a shell, and they might be, what, a quarter of an inch mm -hmm. thick to maybe three eighths would be a fat one. Uh, this is the wax casting of Tosho's hands. Uh, and you can see the, the extension of the wrist there is, is the pouring area there. There's a, a reservoir that allows you to kind of fill up the mold. And Vanessa, you can see the blade, and here's the underside of the blade with that inscription. You are absolutely welcome to cut this and hold this and this is yours. And you're not mistaken, you were using the right tools a little bit ago. One thing that Kathy is wrong, that this is just happening after, this is not remaining in the cast. Correct. Right. Because the, the, the bronze melts away. away.
exactly. This this wax is this wax is then dipped in and out of a ceramic slurry, which builds a ceramic shell around it, which then is fired in a kiln. As a process of that, it 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 it, it bakes that ceramic shell. The wax is melted away, creates a new void, and into there, the bronze is poured. And then there's what Vanessa was referring to as all the different technicians and artisans who make these hands actually come to be. You have the foundrymen, the, the welders, the chasers, the patinators. I mean, there's a whole, there's like what, eight or nine people, eight or nine different skilled crafts before a piece actually sits on a table upstairs for you to hold. And You can, you would. When we do our job right, all we remove is hair. That's right. <laughs> so, um, you may say, oh, it's not a problem. And it's, it is. <laughs> it, it, it really is a problem. It is. <laughs> Under an hour, yeah. It's also the rubber keeps you moving along as well. You're working with a material that's setting up. You get everything completely ready and you don't start mixing the rubber until everything's in place, everything is ready to hand. There's no downtime, no stopping. An hour is really Over the years, Vanessa and I... You're pretty much locked there. Yeah. There is a point at which your gesture is being supported by yeah. the rubber glove, and there's a you can relax into it. Yeah. Judy Fast is the only good example. Yeah. But please have a moment and, and look at this because it's very clean. If you can't hurt it, it's sacrificial. It's here for you to look at. This is coming out of the mold, warts and all, with seam lines and air bubbles and things that are not. Well, <laughs> we can, you can, why don't you talk to the Yeah, iPhone. yeah, um, I, there's no, there's no money exchanged from the artists. There's no cost to the artist. Um, in 2013, after I'd been doing this for a few years, Thomas and I applied for a grant from the, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and we were awarded fiscal sponsorship from NIFA which while they don't give us a bag of money, they give us the 5013C status so that when we have the nerve to go begging for money, our donors get a 100% tax deduction for that. And over the years, we've had some, uh, we've had a, a variety of donations from small to significant. And you have the Rockefeller Brothers. Donation. Yes, in 2019, we were awarded a Rockefeller Brothers Fund grant of $10,000, which was significant, paid for several castings. By and large, it's been a self-funded project. Um, we have upstairs, um, we have upstairs a QR code on the wall underneath our title plaque, which takes you right to the NIFA site, which if you're in the um, mood and position to be able to donate to the American Artist Hands Archive, you can do that. Every drop raises the pond. So I'll be unabashedly talking about that. Um, not including travel and hotels and how far it, 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 or it's or, or any we don't this is um, out of pocket foundry and stuff, maybe seven to seven to ten grand. For one, yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it's all labor. It's all time. It's all labor. It's just time. So it's an expensive proposition, and that's um, 
who said this to me? Was it Jasper when I was crying in my beer about money? And he said, forget the money. The money comes and goes. It mostly goes. Get the work done. Because people, well, people, people will not be here. And that opportunity, yeah. I would say really quite diverse, you know, I mean, between gender and age and, and length of career. Uh, the people who are in the archive, for the most part, have established themselves in their careers and have made significant contributions, and that's why they become candidates and participants. Uh, but it's uh, the urgency of getting some of the folks who, you know, are, are aging in their careers, that we want to have them in there and that we want to hear their stories. It's not just about capturing their hands. We want to talk to them. Why do you do what you do? You know, I mean, to, to have somebody talk so beautifully, poetically, and intimately about why they spent their life doing this is, I mean, it's an incredible treasure. I mean, what a privilege to be able to sit and listen to people talk. You know, one of our participants, Bill Crozier, is here today, and I've had the pleasure, honor, to talk with Bill at length about his work. And to be able to be in the presence of makers and then to somehow capture that and share that with the folks who see the archive. That's beautiful. Right? That's what keeps us going. You know, so I'll give this back to you. Thank you. You have a question. Oh, several layers. It adheres to itself. Often I'll do the first layer as a painted coat, and then I add this thickener to it to back it up and make the cake. Yeah. When we're, we're working together, I'll catalyze and feed to her, and so that there's a this. We've we've done molds over major pieces of sculpture where there's hundreds of gallons of rubber, <laughs> and you you have to have the catalyzation and the rubber this. and make sure that everything is catalyzed, <laughs> and so there's this whole sort of surgical setup before anyone yeah. says we're, we're yeah. sure everything goes right. Like but I it said, will stick to itself. My, my rubber always sets, but my bread, <laughs> not so good. So I stay out of the kitchen. You have a question. Hi. Hi. Both. Both. Depends on the configuration. What I often do is I'll make the tiniest cut with a little blade or a scissor at the wrist and let them wiggle out so that when we cast the initial wax, this, it minimizes the seams. Um, I cut this piece in half today for your visual, but I normally wouldn't do such a thing. I try to keep it a glove mold. Uh, I was actually telling Vanessa that I bought the new shoes, right? These shoes, they tie up the front, but they're high booted shoes. So there's a zipper along the side so you can put your, the same thing sort of happens, you know, because the, the glove can go over the hand and then there can be an incision that goes up at the sort of relieves and then you wiggle out. But you're not actually cutting the whole thing. You know, so there's a, a, an access with the minimum amount of shift. Uh, if you take a look at this hand here, this was, we made the mold in Amsterdam, took the mold off my hand, put it upside down, I immediately poured urethane, so this is the urethane. And this is the only tiny shift here. So you can see how accurate it is and how you have to wiggle yourself out of a difficult situation without too much trouble. Did I see anything? Uh, are you continuing to grow the archive? Oh, are you absolutely. So funding notwithstanding, you're doing that? Absolutely. And you said there are visual recordings, there's video recordings. Do you think you'll create that? Will there be a book that would go along with absolutely. this, I would think? All of the above. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. You want to take a walk? You want to go upstairs? When we go upstairs, there's only two sculptures that we're, we're going to we're gonna go upstairs on the library table up there. There are jewelry tags, and there's a pair of curatorial gloves. Put the gloves on, and you can handle any bronze that's up there, with the exception of two. Uh, James Hart, that was the gentleman with the knife. That'll cut you. Vanessa has a great saying. She says, art can make you cry, but it shouldn't make you bleed. <laughs> That's the only sculpture of that it could probably make You'll you see it. It's You'll the red one now. with the blade. And then Tosho's is extremely heavy, so that's another one that we're going to ask that we don't pick up. Uh, but everything else is fair game. Uh, so we'll go up there. Yeah. And, and you can put on the gloves. They're in the library. And you can go over to the table and pick up any bronze you like. 
and look at it there, or you can bring it over to the table and examine it there. Just don't drop it on your foot. <laughs> and then you can just leave them on the jewelry tags on the table after you're done looking, and people can go around. It's sort of like the dim sum of the archives. <laughs> 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 <laughs>